So I want to bore you with a particular topic today. Um, the title of the presentation is The Conclusion. So that's all you have to remember. Whatever that means, it says, keep the pipe just full, but no fuller. And if you remember Einstein's wonderful quote, he said, make every problem as simple as possible, but no simpler. That's a takeoff on that. So here we are. What I'm going to do now is, is summarize the results of a paper that I presented in this journal, which was dedicated to Mario Gela's 75th birthday. It came out a short while ago. And this is the reference. You'll find it later to the paper that we're going to describe. So TCP. TCP is a way for sending data from a source to a destination in the network. And the way it works is you pump data in, send it to the destination, destination turns around and acknowledges that you got it. And the issue is, how do you control how much traffic flows without causing a problem? And the, the idea is you can measure how much you're sending and see how long it takes to get back so you get some sense of the delivery rate and the response time. And using that information, how do you control the flow so you don't overwhelm the network and don't underutilize its capacity. Well, here is a history of the many congestion control algorithms, you can't read any of these, uh, that have been occurring over the last 30, 40 years. You may recognize some of these names as being the names of the uh, TCP versions that have progressed. And there's a reference which you can go into enormous detail, more detail than you ever wanted, to describe these various protocols. So let's talk about congestion control in the internet. That's what this paper is about. The way it works now is it uses loss as a measure of congestion or buffering. And unfortunately, the way the packet algorithm works is it causes a very erratic behavior, a sawtooth behavior. You pump in a lot, and then you collapse and back off. And you pump in a lot, and you break it, and you collapse and break off. And at the same time, you may introduce some very large delays. So here's a typical picture of the data rate versus time. It grows, it collapses, some loss occurs, and you drop down, and you suddenly thin it out, and you do it again. You keep bumping your head against the ceiling. And all the algorithms in that long chart that I showed you, here's examples of their profiles. They all show that kind of sawtooth bumping behavior a kind of erratic behavior. The system can't decide what to do. And that's the way it's been for some 40 years. Packet loss is not a good way to detect congestion. It interprets loss as buffers. And that may or may not be right. If the loss comes before you fill up the pipe, the pipe is inefficiently used. And if it comes after congestion, you overpump the pipe, you build the buffers, you add delay, and you get nothing out of it. So what to do? Let's look at the way it works now. Let's look at round trip time versus delivery rate, the basic metric that you're interested in. There is a minimum round trip propagation delay um, when there's nothing in the system but your data. And the way it works now is you start Oh, and there's, excuse me, there's a maximum bandwidth you can have, the bottleneck bandwidth. So you start pumping data in slowly, and during that period along the way, you basically are application limited, which means as long as you stay below the bottleneck bandwidth, you can pump in more, but the application isn't giving it to you. So you keep pumping in more until you get to that point. And if you hit that bottleneck bandwidth, you can't pump any more successfully. So where does the extra, extra traffic go? It starts building up in a queue somewhere in the pipe. This is a bad thing. Your bandwidth limited in that domain. And you keep going in a region, but you can't get outside this blue region. You can't go into the crit. You can't do better than the minimum or more than the maximum. At this point, you basically are buffer limited and you start seeing loss. You say, oh, there's loss, let's back off. Oh, let's get some more. Oh, hit the loss, back off again. Can you believe that's the way your internet's been working for 40 years? TCP does exactly that. It's in that range for alpha. Now, there's obviously a better place to operate. 
And that's this point down here. At this point down here, you're succeeding in getting the minimum delay and the maximum bandwidth. Don't push anymore. Keep the pipe just full, but no fuller. And that's the main result of what I want to show you, but I want to talk about the implications of that kind of idea. Basically, the congestion control algorithms are now moving from the alpha region to the beta region. And basically, uh, that's again the reference to the paper I'm, I'm discussing now. Google has represented that, has, has recognized that and started to implement it. And they call it TCP BBR. BBR stands for bottleneck bandwidth round trip time. It says let's operate at the onset of queuing and no more at the point beta I just showed you. It can track the bottleneck bandwidth and it can track the round trip propagation to lay the minimum amount. This idea was first proposed in 1978 and 79, 40 years ago, in a couple of papers that I wrote back then. Unfortunately, nobody did anything with it because there was another paper published which said it won't work. And they said it won't work in a decentralized system. And to first order, that was a correct objection. However, BBR showed you can actually get that information in a distributed system if you estimate it over a distributed amount of time using a kind of sliding window approach. So the folks at Google recognized that. They went back to this paper and said, let's implement that as this new thing called BBR. So keep that in your mind and I'll show you some of the implications of this idea. Let's look at some systems of flow. The system is flow is where you pump something in at one end and it pops out at the other end. Okay. Suppose you pump in things at a rate lambda packets per second and you can deliver a maximum amount of mu packets per second. The ratio of lambda to mu is the well-known utilization factor. It represents the efficiency of the system. If it's less than one, you're not getting 100% efficiency. If it's more than one, you're probably flooding the system. And there's a response time. How long does it take? So you want to sort of play games with the efficiency and the response time. That's what the other chart was talking about. Now, of course, there's a well-known function which you should have studied already called the bandwidth delay product. Basically, it's a network with a certain capacity. There's a certain time it takes to send data when it's very lightly loaded, basically nothing else but you. And the bandwidth delay product, BDP, is the bandwidth of the pipe, mu, the minimum along the pipe, time to time to get through when there's no other interference. And it's a very important engineering quantity which you should have studied in your, in, in your early days. And let's look at some systems of flow, either deterministic or random. Again, there's the picture. There's a key metric in these networks called the average number in system. And you, I'm sure you've all studied it. If you haven't, you're going to learn it right now. The famous Little's result. Little's result talks about the average number in the system. And it's easily represented as the input rate times the average time in system. Now if we normalize the quantities there, let's normalize them with respect to the no load delay, which is the time to get through if nobody's in your way, which is your own service time. If you normalize basically the t divided by t0, which is mu t0, and of course rho as well, you get this expression. This expression simply reduces to rho mu t of rho. And those are the quantities we're going to play with. That's the famous Little's result. It applies to any system. There's no assumptions of Poisson, exponential. All it has to do is be, an, if you will, an ergodic system. So let's start with some very simple systems, deterministic systems, where everything is predictable and, and synchronized. And we're going to revisit the BBR congestion control. Look at the response time versus the efficiency, the two important metrics. There's the minimum amount. You can have a maximum you get with row when it reaches 100%. And that's a simple, for queuing theorists among you, how many of you ever studied queuing theory? Anybody? In the front row? Gentlemen. <laughs> they don't study queuing theory here? <laughs> ah, but they're young, they're young students. Yeah. I have homework for you. <laughs> By a deterministic system, we mean the input is periodic and the service time is constant. 
and it's a single server. Let's normalize that as we did before, dividing by the minimum time. So now the axes become mu t and one. The minimum time is a normalized amount one, and you're gonna get a behavior here. And deterministic system says you can't do any better than the minimum in time, and you can't get any more than the maximum efficiency. The same picture I showed you before. And n bar is rho mu t, and the star in any of my equations implies we've optimized with respect to some measure of optimality. Well, the obvious optimal operating point is the one I told you about before, that point beta. At that point, you're getting the minimum delay and the maximum throughput. You can't ask for any more. I don't care what metric of optimality you would use. And it turns out in this case that if you take that product, um, rho is one at that point, and mu t is also one. So the product is one. And it happens also to be the bandwidth delay product. So the interesting thing is, at this optimum point, the bandwidth delay product is equal to one, is equal to the optimum number in system. That's sort of an interesting observation, but it's a very simple system. Everything is deterministic. It says keep the pipe just full, pump in just enough and no more. You could put k of these things in series, pump in lambda here, how much should it be? There's a response time. If all of these units, if all of these units have the same speed, the same bandwidth, then if the example is set the input, the optimum input equal to the speed of each node, and the average number in system is how many queues there are, how many pipes there are in the chain, how many links in your session connection. It's equal to K. Keep the pipe just full. Put one in each. Nobody else can handle it anymore, they're gonna form a queue. And in fact, it turns out that each node is exactly one as you might expect. If the unequal rate is a similar formula, there's a minimum speed, call that mu sub m, then you find that the optimum number is this sum. It's a sum of the times in each node times the speed of the minimum. And that's always less than k. And that's the optimum point to be. Now there's an interesting observation here. When you have a q, Typically, how many people in a system? It could be a moderately large number. It could be 5, 10, 20, 50. This says no, keep it down to one in each pipe. Keep it well underloaded, or else you're going to build up queues you don't need. Most queuing theorists allow queues to get fairly large, because there's a kind of randomness about it. We're going to try to control it to keep things down at a small number, as we're beginning to see here. And it turns out also that the optimum number is the bandwidth delay product. So I can modify the basic result, keep the pipe's bottleneck just full, but no fuller. And nodes which are not the bottleneck be, may be less than full, but the bottleneck is determining how much you can get. Now let's look at some stochastic systems. Typical time plot. Response time versus row looks like that. It gets worse as you improve, increase the efficiency because there's randomness, and randomness causes um, delays. Let's generalize the metrics now. Instead of considering efficiency as a thing you want to take advantage of, let's call it any function, G. G stands for good. It's a good thing. You like more of it. And let's generalize this response time, which is a bad thing, as a general B of G, any B of G, any bad function of the good function. So we're going way beyond networks. This could be profit versus investment. It could be traffic flow versus width of the uh, road highway. Anything you like. Any bad function versus good. You can imagine your own. So let's ask a question. Where do you want to operate on this curve? You want to operate here? There's a lot of good but a lot of bad. Or guess what? It could be here where there's a little good and a little bad. Where do you want to operate? Now if the function was the original one, looks like that. You know you want to be here, the minimum bad and the maximum good. But where's the knee of the curve here? It may not be obvious. So, where should we operate? So let's introduce a new metric of performance, one that seems reasonable. Let's introduce something called power. It's good over bad. 
very simple, whatever that function is. And in fact, you want to maximize that, right? A lot of good and a little bad. This is a very technical talk. Okay. <laughs> so mathematically, it looks like that. There's no calculus here. There's only a little bit of algebra. Okay. That's the basic formula. So let's look at this point on the curve. At that point on the curve, guess what? A line from the origin to that point has a slope, which happens to be 1 over power. It's bad over good. So the slope is telling you the power at that point. And the mathematics says you're going to maximize P, the power, when that equation is solved, which simply means you're going to touch this curve at its tangent, out of the origin. And that turns out to be the optimal operating point for the system. Well, that's interesting as long as the curve is nicely convex and differentiable. Um, and this was done in the 1978 paper and exact, ex extended in the new paper. What if it's non-convex? What if it looks like that? Well, there's more than one tangent point. Which is the good one? Well, which has maximum power? The one with the smallest slope. Because the slope is one over the power. So yes, that's the optimum point. And let's generalize a little bit. It's not continuous, it's not convex, it's not differentiable. Some crazy function. Where should you operate? The answer is at a line out of the origin which touches the function with minimum slope. So graphically, it's very easy to find the optimum operating point for any function of bad versus good. So it's a highly generalized function. Now let's go back to networking and, and queuing and consider a stochastic system where the input is random, it's exponential, pass on arrivals, and the service time is exponential for those of you who don't know what this means. Um, it again looks like the curve I showed you a moment ago. <clears throat> And it turns out the expression for mu t is just 1 over 1 minus rho. Power is the same function. Let's replace it by rho and by mu t as we did before. That number is always less than 1. Power in this def definition is always less than 1. Because rho is always less than 1 and mu t is always, gre mu t is always greater than 1. And so that expression for the average numbers that given before and it turns out to look like rho times 1 minus rho. So, the optimum point is there, and it turns out for this MM1 system, that's exactly the case where rho equals a half. That's the maximum power operating point, and it turns out at that point, again, for MM1, the maximum power point gives you the average number in the system is 1. Once again, in fact, what you're doing is you're giving up half the efficiency and you're eating more than one times the delay. It turns out you're eating two times the delay. So with randomness, you have to give up some efficiency, eat a little bit of delay, but the optimum point turns out to be, as before, average number should be one. Let's dig deeper. We found out the maximum power of the average number is one. Why? Well, go back to your deterministic reasoning, even those who didn't study queuing theory, okay? Here's a, a queuing system. There's a server. Somebody comes in and says, serve me. More people come behind. Now, what are those people doing in queue? They're wasting time. They're getting nothing, and they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs. A better idea to minimize the response time, don't let them come in, okay? In this situation, the server's busy 100% of the time. Nobody's wasting time in the queue. And when that person leaves, put the next person in. Feed them in one at a time. You get the minimum response time and the maximum efficiency. One customer, if you could do it. So the insight is, once again, in this silly situation, keep the pipe just full. The pipe is the server. One customer, no more. Our intuition says put exactly one person in the system. That deterministic reasoning. But we can't do that in general. We can't control who's coming in and going out. The earlier result said 
let the rate in be such that on average you have one in the system instead of exactly one. That's what we come for MM1. And as I told you before, you eat, you eat, you're getting half the throughput and eating twice the delay. So that's rather interesting. This power thing, which came out of nowhere, is modeling what your intuition says should be. Keep the pipe just full and no full. Or just full means the average number of systems. Sometimes there's less than one person. Too bad, you're wasting efficiency. Sometimes there's more than one person. Too bad, you're introducing extra delay. But balance it right there at one on average. What about the MG1 system? That was MM1 I showed you a moment ago. The pictures look like this. Those are a variety of, of MG1 system general service times. The MD1 system is there. The MM1 system is there. We saw that a moment ago. And here's a bunch of others. Now what can we say about this system? What is interesting about that set of intersections? Well, guess what? That's the place where the average number in any of those systems is exactly equal to one. So again, you want the average of any MG1 system to be at one. That's the result. Now let's look at power, power itself. I want to show it on this usual axis, the normalized response time versus the normalized throughput, or if you will, the efficiency. We know that's what the power equation tells us. Let's solve that for mu t. A little bit of algebra, ladies and gentlemen. Boom. That says the mu t functions are linear functions of rho. And there they are. That's constant power curves, and there's the power from 1 down to 0. OK. Let's do the same thing for the average number and system. We have that equation. Again, a little hard algebra, solve from mu t. And you find that now the, the response time is a, basically a hyperbola with respect to rho. There they are. There's the lines of constant number and system. Now, let's put both of those together for any queuing system. And there's the set of average number and power. This is independent of the queuing system. Go to any point here, and it'll tell you what the average number is and what the power is. Any queuing system. But there's a little problem here. This number goes off the chart. I mean, it can go up to infinity. It's, it's a bad plot. I can't scale it. So let's get smart. Let's take one over the response time. And now we have a one by one, a one by one square. Now everything is contained in a simple square. Put the same curves in there with this inverse function, and you get that. And this is what I like to call the universal power profile. It's all in that picture, no matter what the queuing system is. And different queuing systems have s curves along this in different ways. So that, that's an important result to remember. Let's look at MG1. That turns out to be the picture. I've shown you only a queue. Here's some of the hyperbola for power. And here's one of the average number in system. It turns out to be 1. And this is, for example, the MD1 queuing system. This is the MM1, and here's some other MG1 curves. Now, if you look at MM1, that's this curve here. This one here, it's a straight line, it turns out. What you want is to take this curve and choose a point along the curve which gives you the maximum power. Well, it's a kind of tangent fit. This turns out to be a symmetric curve. It'll line up with that power curve. And sure enough, that's the point you want, right? right there. And of course, if you look at a power curve in the same plot, it gives you the power of a quarter at rho equal to half. And for MD1, you do a similar thing. It's always at the 45 degree line. And every one of these has an optimal operating point, And they all lie along this line, which happens to be, guess what, average number system is 1. So it gives you a, a graphic tool for deciding where to operate these systems. Okay, so there's a summary theorem for all of this coming back to the TCP idea. If n star is the optimal number in the pipe, for all systems that we've looked at, the average optimum average, the average number optimized is equal to the bandwidth delay product. And for DD1, 
and all MG1 systems, that optimum number is one. For a series of net, of, of net, to me, for multiple server system, um, which K servers, or a network of K in series, either of DD1 systems, or K identical MM1 systems, or K identical MD1 systems, the answer is all the same. Put one in each server. One in each server of K. For any series network of K heterogeneous DD1 systems, or of heterogeneous MD1 systems, that's the answer. I showed you that before. Basically, you're seeing the average number is less than or equal to K. And the whole point of all of these is always equal to the bandwidth delay product. And it's a small number. It's typically less than or equal to the number of servers that you have in the system. So that's all I wanted to say. It gives you a lot of insight into all of this. Keep the pipe just full and no further. Thank you very much.